thought. And the idea to live longer, to extend your life, might be very uh, intriguing for many people. Now, as it sounds like science fiction, but now there might be possibilities to live 120, 130, maybe 150 years, or at least there's research on that. The question is, how is it done? And do we want that? What are the possible also negative consequences or consequences we should think about when we discuss um, this research topic? Um, these are some questions that we want to discuss in the next 90 minutes. Um, if the audience wants to ask questions as well, just write it in the chat and we will pick some of them. But first I want to introduce uh, my guests. First of all, there's uh, Lisa Fabini Kaiser. She's the CEO of the Sense Research Foundation. Um, she, uh, it is a nonprofit organization that is researching on life extension um, possibilities. Then there's Dr. Ravi Jain. He's um, the vice president of research at Sense Foundation. A very warm welcome to you. Um, I have a Professor Sike Schicktanz, who is um, a bioethicist at uh, the University of uh, Göttingen, and uh, Professor Hans Jörg Eni, also a bioethicist um, from the University of Tübingen. Um, I have the filmmaker uh, of the film More Life um, that we broadcast last year on DW and which is still on YouTube, and the film which was. Um, the basis for the discussion this evening, um, Martin Koddenberg. He's an author and filmmaker um, living in Berlin. And last but not least, um, Dr. Dieter Rosa, a colleague of mine. He's the commissioning editor in the DW documentary department for this film. So um, my first question would go to my colleague Dieter Rosa. Um, how did you come up with the idea or why did you think this topic would be interesting, a very complex topic, uh, to make a film about. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, we started the project, uh, the documentary More Life, in, at the end of 2019. In those days, uh, the theme was somehow in the air, in newspapers, in magazines, uh, on social media. Um, and it's obvious extending life uh, concerns um, everyone, but uh, we are living beings. But the main point is, uh, for me, it was quite new, the new approach, the way of thinking to say, uh, okay, um, aging is the disease. You uh, don't uh, uh, fight, against, uh, you don't fight age, uh, related uh, diseases like cancer, like diabetes, like uh, Parkinson. No, you go, you go to the cause and, uh, and the cause is um, aging. And uh, we thought uh, this might be uh, a good story, uh, important story to be told uh, in a documentary. And we wanted to, we wanted serious science and we wanted, uh, scientists uh, who could uh, explain the topic and um, but we, uh, also we wanted to have uh, uh, a thrilling documentary we wanted uh, a real, uh, to have a film um, and um, thanks to the director to martin kottenberg i hope uh, it has been uh, successful okay. yes um martin um what intrigued you about the topic um of well longevity of life extension well i guess as a filmmaker there's um certain topics that you come across and which are really you know sort of big and interesting questions to tackle and um you know you can you can make a film about climate change or i don't know going to mars or something like that but really um i thought that um you know dealing with this topic with um life extent life itself and life extension is um a lot more you know at the core and a lot more interesting because yeah as Dieter was saying it affects every one of us and it has been affecting every one of us for a very long time ever since um people could actually think and were conscious of themselves they um thought about their own um you know eternity and their own death so yeah and and now we're at a point where we're actually 
maybe we can do something about this with, um, you know, with medicine and we might actually have a shot of extending our life a little bit. And we already did. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Bini Kaiser, what is the Sense Foundation or Sense Research Foundation? Sorry. What are you doing? That's okay. Either is fine. So Sense Research Foundation was founded in 2009 to look at a damage repair approach to aging. So yes, diseases and disabilities of aging, but also aging as a whole as the, the main contributor to those diseases and disabilities. And we look at a damage repair approach specifically. Um, it Basically, the idea is that aging over time accumulates damage in your body in many forms. And instead of tackling the metabolic processes that cause the damage or to address the pathologies that happen as a result of that damage, we are addressing the damage directly and removing it or attenuating it in a way that creates rejuvenation in the body. So this is, yes, a preventative strategy for the diseases of aging, but it's also a curative. So that's really our, our primary mission is we are primarily a research foundation, but we also do education. So in the documentary, there was some young people. We also take in young people to teach them that aging is something that is not science fiction, that can be addressed scientifically in a laboratory. And we're hoping to um, really grow the next generation of scientists in that way as well. Hmm. Um, aging as a disease, uh, doesn't this, um, well, make us rethink uh, about the whole topic of aging, which was until now a natural thing, it just happened. Um, do you see some downside to this take? I mean, yeah, a little bit. We, we do get pushback about treating aging as a disease, but in reality, there are so many diseases and disabilities like frailty that don't happen until you get older. And it's really a part of the aging process. And it's something that we really have to tackle um, a little more entirely if you just focus on the diseases one at a time you're not going to make a whole lot of headway but if you focus on the damage that underlies a lot of the diseases a lot of these damages are not unique the same types of damage happen across a lot of different pathologies and if you can address those damages you're actually going to be addressing a lot of the root causes of these diseases at once and i think that's a really important kind of end note that this isn't necessarily for srf about longevity. I mean, longevity is a great byproduct. I mean, we all want to live a little bit longer, but really it's about extending our health span, about making the people that we care about and love live longer. I think most of us have lost at least a grandparent, if not a parent. And it's devastating. It's not something you get over. It's something that you just kind of learn how to live with that loss. And we're saying that not only is that loss not necessary, but that the, how that loss happens is not necessary either. Having that debilitation that happens as you get older and older, that loss of independence, that loss of mental faculties, that doesn't have to happen that way. And I think when you rephrase the conversation around that, that aging is a problem and it creates all these things that really harm the people you care about and love, that people are much more willing to get on board um, and really get invested in the cause. And I think it's, it's a worthwhile cause at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jane, um, why do we age at all? Can you put this in simple words? Why are we aging? Um, can we put this in simple words? Sure. I, I think Lisa <laughs> did a great job of it. We, um, we accumulate damage as we age. So we like to be out in the sun. We enjoy a glass of wine. All of these things have effects on our body, whether um, they're extrinsic or intrinsic. And we age in the way that we look at it at, at the Sense Research Foundation is through that accumulated damage over, the, over our lifetimes. Um, and so that is why, as Lisa was saying, reversing that damage has the potential to reverse, and I put that in quotes, the aging process. Mm -hmm. How can I how can I imagine if I want to live longer? I mean, maybe not it's not happening today, but maybe in the next decades, will I have to take pills? Will I have to undergo surgery? Um, what are the most well um, promising ways of fighting um, aging? Uh, there is actually a lot of research and a lot of um, startups that are working on this. At, as we speak. 
Um, most of the modalities, treatment modalities, focus around either cell therapies or small molecules, so pills or injections. Um, surgery is one that I've heard hardly about, so I, I would say that that's unlikely to be a way that we go to prevent ourselves um, from degenerating. Um, and if we look at the, the, the broad sort of spectrum of, of what the sort of things are that people are looking at tackling, are, these are things very much that underlie the aging process in general. So atherosclerosis, the hardening of arteries, the extracellular matrix, the stiffening thereof, um, dysregulation and accumulation of mutations, mitochondrial degeneration, which leads to frailty and sarcopenia. All of these things are being tackled right now as we speak, and people are coming up with therapeutics for those things. And most of those therapeutics are uh, pills in the form of pills, because fundamentally aging, if, 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 the, only, if the only sector of society that can, that can afford to live, have a longer health span is, is very small, then we haven't really done the job of lifting the entirety of humanity um, to the potential and possibilities that extending health span provides. So in addition to just simply thinking of aging, we also have to think about aging as the, the curing of aging or the, the um, extending of health span as something that really needs to percolate through every layer of society. Uh, Professor Schicktanz, um, you are a bioethicist. Um, what what is your domain? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, well, my domain in my research and teaching to medical students, but also students of philosophy and sociology includes um, what we would call ethical reflection on modern technologies. And this is actually... Um, a very interesting field you were just talking about, namely to use and invent technologies to improve or at least to change the life course. And this is one very broad area. So I've done research on um, genetic testing, um, biotechnology in general, but also how to uh, include different perspectives, not only perspectives of researchers, but also perspectives of patients, relatives, and the general public. Mm -hmm. um, when I hear about the possibilities um, of extending one's life, um, it sounds basically first promising and positive to me. Do you see <clears throat> any maybe the consequence we, that we should think uh, about, maybe negative, uh, negative consequences? I mean, first of all, I think it's it's a really the, the crucial question for this whole discussion is what actually do we talk about? Do we talk about healthy aging in the sense of we all have a higher, much higher chance to get 90, 95 and then have almost no disease and then from one day to the other we die? Is this <clears throat> the vision or is it... <clears throat> Sorry, I just said Corona, so that's another um, uh, more more <laughs> general um, problem, I guess, for for health in many countries now. Um, <clears throat> that is also an age-related disease, somewhat. <laughs> oh, I, I think I'm not so old aging. yet, and I think a lot of people <laughs> I, I I met who were quite young also had Corona, so I would be a bit cautious to put everything in the as, as age-related. Um, but in general, I think it's really important what is really the vision. I mean, I heard here the, the healthy aging vision, but then I think you also brought up the idea, and I think that's what also some of the um, researchers sometimes um, promote, is the idea that we really become much older, like 150, 180 or even longer. And I think this makes a huge difference for the ethical debate. So first of all, I think... Uh, aging in a healthy state sounds great and I think a lot of people individually uh, would appreciate this and if we look back in history that's what actually happened if you look back just the last 50 years so many people have such a higher chance to become 80 and have 
they, cognitively and physically, they are really fit if you would compare them to their own grandparents. So this is something which is already fantastic. But on the other hand, um, there are still in also Western societies, there's a large gap between the chance to become 80 and almost healthy or just to die with 60. And this depends mainly on the socioeconomical background and the working conditions. And I think this is one of the major injustices I still see. And I think that um, all this um, research on new pills will not solve already this existing injustice. Mm -hmm. Professor Ini, uh, you wrote uh, about the consequences or possible consequences of life extension as well, amongst other uh, papers you wrote. And what is your take on that topic? Well, I think we have to start to look at the topic um, from a more general perspective on aging, what is positive about aging, what is negative about it. And we have been talking only about physical aging at this point and biological aging. And um, that is not all to it. Otherwise, um, it would also make no sense to make us live longer and get older if that's, that would be something only, only negative. So um, I think if we are talking about aging in an exclusively negative sense, that is something that we have to be careful about. And um, we have to differentiate between psychological aging, between the possibility of personal growth, and um, the negative aspects of biological aging, which is um, possibly causing diseases or which um, the science is um, now, I think, providing evidence that it can cause diseases. So that is that is the first precaution I would take. Then secondly, I, I think we have to differentiate the different goals, just as uh, Seke Schichtens has just said. And then we have to look at the potential social consequences and um, how, can we, how can we deal with those consequences. So that said, I, I agree that um, there is a use, huge potential of benefit and um, that this is, if it's going to be possible, it's going to happen. But we have to be careful as we go along and we have to sort of be careful also about uh, about scientific activism and and this push towards uh, applications um, which are not well proven just as in the documentary you could go to the clinic in Hong Kong or um, or uh, there is starting to be some evidence for some treatments but not really um, sound evidence in terms of clinical trials. So this research is in a phase of transition as well. And um, I think we have to be careful that this transition is going to have to be happening also in the context of sound, ethically sound science. Mm -hmm. um, we got already a lot of um, comments while the film was online uh, about the topic and one um, one comment um, that came again and again was the question, will um, a life extension be for everyone or just for the wealthy? Yeah, we are a global um, broadcasting company. We have audience in, in African countries, in Asian countries, in Latin America, wherever, in the US, etc. cetera. Um, but this came a lot. Um, Ms. Fabini Kaiser, what are you saying about this comment or critical point? So I think it's a valid question and we hear it a lot at our organization as well. And Dr. Jane already had kind of addressed that a little bit and saying that we really haven't done our job if it's not accessible to everyone. And that is extremely true at our organization. We are always pushing to make sure that the therapies that we create are accessible because they have to be. Um, my, I do not come from a wealthy family and a lot of my push to get these therapies on the market are to support people like my father, who's in his mid seventies with heart disease and diabetes. Um, and if it's only for the wealthy, he's not gonna benefit. And that's not that's not okay for me. <laughs> um, I don't think it's gonna be okay for a lot of people, but I think right now, at least, we're in a situation where it's the wealthy people who are really driving this, this whole 
community and this whole industry forward. And so they're probably going to see the benefits a little sooner. Um, but like you said, um, we have to be careful about doing it, about doing these um, treatments that are a little not fully fleshed out maybe um, in Hong Kong, for instance. And I'm, I'm gonna say this gently, I am mildly okay with the wealthy people who wanna do these experiments on themselves and try them out and give us the data um, to do so. If they have the money to do it and they wanna be their own test subjects and they wanna do it in a way that allows us to see kind of what's going on and it helps the scientific community at large, sure. If that eventually leads to FDA approved, at least in the States, FDA approved therapies that go on market, I'm all for it. Um, we have a spinoff, one of our spinoffs is Cyclarity um, and they are doing some work in atherosclerosis and they are looking at a small molecule drug and they are in the UK going through their process right now because the UK is making it faster and cheaper for them to do it than the USA. And their goal is to have eventually, I believe it's a $10 pill. They're not there yet, but a $10 pill that you can take, which is cheaper than you can get insulin in the United States. Um, and so not only as a nonprofit, are we excited about making these therapies accessible to everyone? Because we think they have to be. But we're making sure that the spinoffs we do, that we have a board seat in, an observer board seat in, are also keeping that mentality so that anything we spin out is really benefiting everyone. And I think as a nonprofit, that also has to be where our focus is. Hmm. Mr. Kottenberg, you wanted to add something? Because I, so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Because when we were making this film, uh, this film, um, there was a bit of an irony that we picked up on um, because it depends on what we're talking about, because if we're talking about, you know, extending your life by taking pills and, you know, taking a bit of a shortcut for, um, you know, for example, the guy in Hong Kong was clearly, you know, he was working crazy hours every single day and, you know, he was really, yeah, not looking after himself so well. So, you know, there was sort of, this idea, I guess, for him to, to, you know, experiment with the pills and maybe, you know, make up for that, you know, you know, not so great lifestyle. So, um, you know, there's, there's this irony that we picked up that actually the people who are the poorest, the people who live in, in Costa Rica, these people are actually, you know, they used to be farmers, you know, they picked fruits off the fields and, you know, had a really healthy diet for that matter. Um, you know, they were actually the one achieving longevity right now. Whereas, you know, if you take the map and you draw a line north, like a couple of thousand kilometers, there's all these super rich people who pour bazillions of dollars into it, um, you know, to get the one thing that so far money can't buy them. You know, there's a bit of an irony in that. So, yeah, that, that's sort of interesting, I think. Um, yeah. If I can talk to that for just a minute. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, I like to say a lot that um, I am not in my peak health, right? I, I enjoy cake and a glass of wine and I try to exercise and I eat right when I can, but I'm, I'm not a perfect person. And there are a lot of people who are striving for that perfection level of, of health and food consumption and exercise to try to reach their, their optimum longevity. But there's so many of us who just don't have that luxury. Like the single mom with three kids who's working double shifts to like make rent, like she with barely making her healthcare, like they don't, they don't have those opportunities to have the perfect lifestyle to optimize their longevity without medical intervention. And so I think that's also kind of a part of what we're doing is that we're really interested in the medical intervention side of things because not all of us have the ability to live in the blue zone of beautiful Costa Rica, where the the woman in the the older woman in the documentary said, you know, live a stress free life. And I'm like, that sounds lovely. What's that like? Um, not I'm not going to say there's also a blue zone in California, but okay, that's that's you okay. Know that. But but still, but still, right? I mean, it's it's difficult, and and it's difficult to get there. Maybe you can get there at some point in your life, but can you stay there? And and what about you know? It's just there's so many confounding factors that we want this technology, this this ability to live a, a long, healthy life, healthy life, to be available to everyone, even if even if they like chocolate cake, you know, a little too often. Okay, Dr. Jane, um, when I look at uh, those, well, 
some billionaires uh, who are investing in companies uh, that do research um, about the topic, about longevity. There are uh, the big shots of the tech industry as well. There's Jeff Bezos, there's Peter Thiel, the investor. Um, there is uh, uh, Larry Page from Google, et cetera. Larry Ellison, I think. Um, very rich people. So the thought that uh, it might be more something for wealthy people is not so far-fetched, I think. Um, what do you think about that? And and how do you compete, let's say, compete a sense research foundation in this big market? So <clears throat> I think Martin's film actually showed that the opposite is true, that it isn't for rich people, um, that heck, those, those, those farmers and um, people living in Costa Rica were not wealthy, yet they were outliving most billionaires, I would argue. Um, <clears throat> And before I sort of delve into, into the, the tech side of these things and, and the competition and how we compete, um, I also want to point out something that Martin said in his film, which was that social, a social infrastructure and a social net, um, a community, was, was, it, it was mentioned briefly, but I think is incredibly important to long life. Um, that without that a lot of our conversation has to do with the individual and repairing an individual. And we sometimes or often gloss over what our community actually looks like and does for our health. So during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, we had this idea that um, we would get, uh, what is that called? The, uh, when, when a large population is, has has gone through the disease and you um lisa <laughs> herd immunity herd immunity that only happens when you have a herd i suspect that health is very much the same way in general and as is longevity is you have you have it in a herd so that actually i i would say very much speaks to the point that it's not just the billionaires that will do it individually and in an isolated way, right? It will take um, a herd, it will take a community uh, to live longer. I think Hans Jorg was saying um, about mental mental health, right? And, and as you age, what does that look like? Again, isolation is not really well suited for mental health. But now going back to your question about how do we compete as Sense Research Foundation amongst all these billionaires that are pouring money into these different companies and organizations, our approach is incredibly unique, right? It, and it has been, and we were solitary in this approach for the last 14 years until this rejuvenation biotechnology community really sprang up. And I would argue largely due to the Sense Research Foundation. And while a lot of uh, research and a lot of uh, commercial enterprises are looking at uh, looking at prevention and looking at how do we get to the underlying causes of diseases. There are not many companies um, that are actually looking at it from a d damage repair standpoint. So our positioning is quite unique in this entirety of the field. Um, and that is how we compete. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, come back to Professor Schicktanz uh, about this question of equality or inequality. Um, do you think that it will be something longevity more for wealthy people than for poor people? I, I just thought it's so interesting what Ravi said on the one hand, focusing that the Sense Research Foundation and also I think many other researchers in, in my field here at the university, for example, focus more on the biomolecular perspective. And that's exactly what you explained what aging is about in your understanding. But then on the other hand, uh, Martins, and, and you also um, stressed the fact that perhaps, perhaps social networks, um, the, the social environment is so important. It has so protective, obviously protective um, uh, functions. And then I think, is this really consistent then to focus in the research only on the biomolecules and not on the social level? So where's the sense research foundation um, putting this, um, this, this relation between the biomolecules and the social. And, and, and I think this is actually where 
also we bioethicists are a bit concerned that on the one hand, there is a lot of evidence that the social con conditions are so important for good aging. And then on the other hand, the way how resources are allocated, mainly in the medical or biotechnical perspective, this is what worries us. So the, the question is for me really about the true motivation behind this. Is this really about making people happier or is this also about just following particular interests, let's say, to put it like this? And and on the other hand, I think there's also a lot of inconsistency in the theory building. On the one hand, I think we have this idea, and, and Lisa just mentioned it, by the way, on the one hand, people want to have these pills to compensate a kind of unhealthy, let's say unhealthy, but perhaps a lifestyle that makes you happy. Me too. I mean, I also love cake and a glass of wine, you know, but then to have, on the other hand, all these nice examples of people living in a unpolluted um, island, um, eating fruits without any insecticides and pesticides and so on. And then we say, this is perhaps the reason why they live so long. Isn't this a kind of hypocrisy? I mean, actually, I think we really need to think a bit more about these different factors, and how they really interlink. And this is what I personally really miss. And this, again, brings me then to the question, is this really something we want to help everybody or is this rather to, to put it a bit more provocatively, to, to look out for new markets? And we know, by the way, the anti-aging market is one of the biggest in the last 20 years. I mean, everybody pays just a little bit more for this toothpaste or for any um whatever cosmetics if there's an anti-aging label on it so it's a super perfect um um money maker <laughs> and so this is a bit my worries it's whether the true research really happens which will really help us or our future generations to age in a happy and so to say more healthy way and so this is a bit my doubt um, from a conceptual point of view. We have one question in the chat that I would like to hand over to Professor Eni. Um, uh, a user is writing, we have limited resources, water, food, medical health, um, more people getting older, the world population growing. Um, our existence as we know, could it be in danger? I mean, uh, there are, I think there are two, two parts in it. One is, what do we do if people live for 120 years or more, and we are 11 billion people on this planet, could this be a danger? I mean, I have two things to say to that. On the one hand, for sure, if this, um, and I mean uh, more than moderate life extension, let's say up to 150 years or more, for example, is going to happen very quickly, then of course we see another huge increase in the world population. So I think there is an American colleague and bioethicist who has calculated that if we um, will live longer until 150 years and every woman um, is going to have two children, then the population in that group will double in a very short time. So um, an increase in, in the overall population will for sure be happening if this is going to happen very quickly. And that's a, in a way also a dilemma to the other question. If the more people have access to that, the more, on the other hand, the increase of the population will be a problem. And considering the resources um, we have, of course, it is not just about population, and I'm also a bit reluctant to say overpopulation, considering that um, it's not the population number as such which causes the problem, but a particular lifestyle is. So the question really then is, can we adapt to that? And can we find a way um, to benefit from this kind of research? without causing huge environmental or social justice problem or having a huge disruption in a way that the con we may achieve the goal that many, many, many people will live much longer. 
but the conditions for them will be quite bad so that in the end this is not going to be desirable i don't think this is um a problem that cannot be solved but we have to be aware of that and we have to be aware of the countermeasures and as i said the more quickly this is going to happen the more difficult these problems are going to be um to handle so the, the i think the answer is to go slowly to go for a steady development to set priority on on healthy aging and also on the social conditions in in which people are living and not uh, put not a priority on on life extension but also question our lifestyle and then in the long run it might be much easier to to achieve the cultural change that is positive um, by by these uh, technologies which grant a healthier way to age mm -hmm. Ms. Fabini Kaiser, are you discussing at Sense Research Foundation uh, these questions? I mean, you, you might do it amongst yourself in private uh, with people, but is it is it a concern of you that this technology, if it's really developing, uh, might come too quickly or be um, be spread in an unequal way? Um, so the short answer is yes. <laughs> We, we, we don't consider it coming too quickly because I personally, and I think our entire organization doesn't think that um, alleviating suffering can ever come too quickly. Um, but in regards to our existence changing or ending as we know it, um, that's already happened. I mean, a hundred years ago, could you imagine having like a, a computer in your hand? Like our, our existence has changed remarkably every 150 years. I mean, the world we are living in now is not the world my mother lived in. And while we're talking about, I mean, life extension, right? I mean, our life extension used, our life expectancy used to be 35 years. So we've already more than doubled our life expectancy in, our, in the history of our species. That our species is still so young. We're still like in, in the grand scheme of things, we're such a young species. <laughs> um, and I think that we have so much more room for growth. And when we're talking about issues of resources, all I can really say about that, and I, I think I speak for my entire organization, is, man, I would love to have that challenge. I would love to have the opportunity to address that challenge, to have the issue of no longer dying of cancer or of Alzheimer's to go away so that we can focus on how to use our resources more wisely. Because I think that is a discussion that needs to happen. I think right now we have the resources to take care of all of the people on this planet, but we don't. There's so many people that suffer regularly because we don't allocate our resources properly and i think as we grow as a population that's going to be a bigger and bigger issue pardon me but it's going to have to be addressed and i am excited about how that becomes addressed but man i just i want that to be our primary issue i want that to be our problem because that means that we've already solved this aging problem that means that people aren't going to lose their minds they're not going to die horrific deaths right mm -hmm. It, it's that the suffering is going to reduce in that way. And then, great, we've solved that problem. Let's move on. Um, in regards to a little bit about the aging industry being huge and moving too fast, um, I've seen a lot of money go into anti-aging supplements and creams and toothpaste. And at SRF, we roll our eyes as hard as you possibly can about that because we aren't interested in making your teeth whiter for an extra day or making your eye wrinkles go slightly fader, right? We're not, we're, that's not where our interest lies. And that is where a lot of the money is going. That's a lot of where the industry is going. It's, it's how to make a quick buck. It's how to put money into something that will give you a return on your investment within two or three years. And when you're talking about my, biomedical research that has to create real medical therapies, you're talking more of that, the span of 10 to 15 years. Right. I mean, on the low side, I think. And so um, that's where our interest is. And and frankly, there's not enough money in that kind of research. There is far too much money in get this quick injection, get this quick cream, D buy, take a buy a step past the, the real regulatory agencies so that I can get you this thing on the market that may or may, or may not extend your life for a year. Um, and we're not we're not interested in that. But you're right; it is a big industry. Yeah. Um, I have one question. I was I was reading. Um, I think Bill Gates was saying that um, instead of putting um, money 
uh, and he's, I think he spoke to, to his uh, fellow billionaire colleagues, um, instead of putting so much money in, in life extension, they should rather put the money in extending the life of those, for example, who are poorer, uh, who, uh, where the average or the life expectancy is around 56 uh, in some African countries, whereas here, I think in Switzerland, it's 80, is it 85? Um, but there's a huge discrepancy between rich and poor. So what, but what why not your... do both? Why not do both? It's there's not enough happening. There's, yeah. there's enough resources in the world that if we were actually, I mean, this is probably complete sidetrack, but like the amount of money we pay football players, I'm not going to get any fans this way, but the amount of money we play, we pay um, actors and actresses and, and sports people. I mean, they, they are highly entertaining and some actors and actresses can put forth, no offense, Martin, um, some, some really great, some really great messages. But, but like, if you look at like what we're paying our academics to do the work that they're doing that are changing lives, that are saving lives and the, and the amount of resources we're, we're, we're just diverting to things. So when you say, why don't we put money into, into leveling the playing fields a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Let's do that. Let's do both. There's a meme mm. about that. Let, why not do both? Let's do both. Mm. I think they're both valuable. Actually, I agree with Lisa, and um, I was just going to say on the um, on the on the initial question of um, you know how how can we manage our resources, or can we can we make them last longer for everyone when there's more people living here? And there was actually something that Maria said in the end of the film, and she said, "Well, if people live longer, then they might actually you know start to think about how they need to look better after the environment, and um, you know, and and need to use the resources better." So, I don't know. Maybe that's an argument too. Yeah. Professor Schicktanz, do, do you think that people who have a life expectancy of, let's say, 120, 130, 140 years, um, live a more a fuller life than if you have, if you don't know how long you live? Oh, I mean, I think that's a very subjective perspective. I guess. I mean, I think it's very difficult here to find one let's say, solution that fits for everybody. I mean, I think we are we are living in a world where we are all proud to be individualistic. And so I think for some people, <clears throat> um, having a long um, perspective can be very um, comforting. It, it can um, offer them a lot of opportunities to develop this, to have a long-term perspective. But in general, I think living a not only a happy life or a healthy life but also a morally responsible life should um always make us thinking about what are my my impacts and my footsteps on on this world and what do i um provide for benefits and perhaps also for problems for the next generation independent whether i live 30 years 50 years or 100 years so <clears throat> so in this sense i think um the it might be more psychologically more reasonable to think the longer people live they might care more for the next generation not only for your own children but perhaps grandchildren grand grandchildren and so on but i think the point that uh, hans Jörg made before namely that it's more likely that people just will use much more resources the longer they live and that they always have this hope okay and that's actually what we observe now. I mean, we always hope next generation will solve and clean up behind us because we didn't manage to do so. Um, so I'm, I doubt that this is really, I think this is a kind of technical or future optimism I can understand as precision, but I think it's not a very morally reliable position we should lean on. and say okay let's hope that this would solve the problem um i think it's um very it's it's not very responsible so to say to 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 hope that this will solve um and anyway i think the current problems are so serious at least to my understanding uh, i think we cannot just hope for the next um 100 years of research we have to act now and i think that's the way i i would pose the problem Professor, any when I think um, if I have the perspective of living much longer than I than eighty years, which is already a lot, I think, um, might there be any 
psychological issues? Uh, do you think that something like the meaning of life, uh, having a purpose in life could change if I lived 150 years? Well, I think there is this idea that um, old age means wisdom. But of course, people are not getting wise automatically if they if they uh, if they are getting older. But there is the chance. So I think um, if people would still live much longer, they would also not get automatically wiser. Um, it's also sometimes people say people will not know what to do with their time. I think that's also not a valid objection. I think we have the potential to do much more out of our lives than we are doing now. It will not happen automatically. And maybe some uh, with with some of the other questions, it's the same. The urgency will become maybe even bigger to find something in your life which is worthwhile pursuing if you have more time. Sometimes, sometimes people uh, argue the opposite, that you will just, uh, well, not follow any ambition or you will not find any pursuit worthwhile or postpone it to later on if you have much more time. But I think um, if you live longer, the urgency might, might be even bigger. And as to our other problems, the social problems we've been talking about, I think the urgency to solve them might also get bigger. So there might be some, uh, what, some process which philosophers have called dialectics that our problems will get worse by these developments and we might be able to solve them with more urgency because it's more urgent to do so. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Jane, um, when I also pick up some more of the comments we got uh, and questions um, about the topic, um, um, there were people saying um, what happens when people get much older to our social welfare system or how do we sustain those people? What does it do to our healthcare system? Will it not be overstretched? Can we pay for that? Um, how would these things change if um, we really reached this goal of having people living much longer than 100 years? I would imagine we would have to evolve all of our systems. So um, Japan always comes to mind when we when we when I think about aging because and, and population growth, right? Because it has had a negative population growth for a while, and people do live. A, a, they do have a fairly high life expectancy, um, and their systems have had to evolve and will continue to have to evolve um, as as that demographic change happens and continues to happen. The uh, our, Right now, we have the globe over a very fragmented system of both social welfare, um, health care, and um, that has caused discrepancies, right, the, from country to country and within country. I think uh, as we step into the future and perhaps live to 150 and 200, all of our systems will have to improve considerably. There are, um, there are these, uh, our, our current systems as they stand uh, tend to be extractive, at least in the US. And when you live a whole lot longer, um, that is no longer a viable thing because uh, the extraction that you can do will have been tapped out. Right. We're getting we're getting close and we will continue continue to inch into that direction until something breaks and we have to change something. And I think this actually speaks to the reason for living longer is we'll have so much longer to innovate. We'll have so much longer to be creative. We will have so much longer to solve problems. Um, how many more Einsteins could there be if we lived much longer? Right. Some of us recognize our genius in, in early in life and others don't recognize their genius until late in life. So there's opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity and uh, there is a need when that, uh, when that time comes for all of our systems to evolve the globe over. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we have one comment that I noted down uh, from somebody who says, I'm an artist. Many creative people managed to produce masterworks into the 80s and 90s. I wouldn't mind creating masterpieces in my late 140s. That goes a bit in, in, in your direction. Um, but some, uh, some critical idea about that could also be, uh, what is with younger people who want to advance? If all the old people stay in their jobs because uh, the likelihood that that I go into pension with 67 or whatever is very low if I live to 120 or 30. So what is about that? Um, our thought, uh, what kind of thoughts are about the social structure of countries? Um, but maybe I, I ask this to um, Professor Schicktanz. Do you have any idea about, are there thoughts about what we do? How, how could we imagine this world? I mean, I think, yeah, that, that's, I think there's a lot of um, ideas and, and literature about all these um, visions about uh, people to live, yeah, perhaps more than 100, 150, 200, 300 years on the one hand. And then on the, um, the other point, I just want to say, I had a family case, my grand auntie, she became, she died in the age of almost 108. And I think it was a really important experience for myself. On the one hand, we always really we were appraising her, and, and she was still cognitively and physically really dramatically fit. She became her first hip, a new hip in her age of 1990. And it was really, the, the hospital was totally aroused, and, and the healthcare um, insurance was not sure how, how to deal with this case. So what I learned from my auntie is that for her, finally, she, she had a healthy aging. I think she would fit nicely in this category. However, I think what was really dramatic for her, and she lived in a house she was, it was her son in, with her daughter-in-law, all the grandchildren around. But what I think really bored her at the very, let's say, decade of her life was that um, those people who are really close to her, namely her husband and her sister, for example, which was my grandma, they died a little bit earlier, which can still happen even if you become very old. And then you don't have anyone who can you can share anymore your, your history or your biography. And then all these grandchildren come and tell you something about the kindergarten and the school, but this is not what's of interest for you anymore. And I think this is really a very important perspective that the individualistic idea of having a, a long life looks is full of ideas, but the, the social setting is so important. And is, is it always, so to say, we are, how we are embedded and how, do we still are be interested in the next generation or is it also that we observe people want to be then more self-centered, for example, and more interested in, in their own ideas and, and, and or having or sharing ideas with people who have on the same mindset, so to say. And I think this is really important. And I don't see that current research really tackles these questions. I think at least the, the medical research focuses mainly on the bodily perspective. But the social surrounding and what would it mean for our working conditions. I mean, I don't know whether you have followed the current situation in France. There is the idea to set the, the age for retirement four years later, from 61 to 65. And you know what's going on? Students in the age of 20 are going to the street and demonstrating. So how would you imagine a world on the one hand where we all have then to live up 100, 120? Do we then still work until 60? Because nobody wants to work longer. I mean, I think if, if our society is not yet ripe, so to say, or, or, or fully em, em, embracing this idea, I have a lot of doubts that this would finally work out very nicely. And I see that there will be much more problems than just, um, um, yeah, um, just benefits. I mean, in the end, it would be a voluntary thing if I want to extend my lifespan or not. Uh, but I wanted to ask um, Ms. Fabini Kaiser a question. Uh, we got also comments about, um, let's say, more or less, are we playing God? Who are we? 
to try to extend uh, a life in a way that was not uh, like it was in nature before. Do you get sometimes uh, like letters, emails um, in this direction from religious groups or anything else? Very rarely, but yes. Um, I think especially because we have a focus on age-related disease in a lot of ways. Um, it, somebody can say to you, well, aren't you playing God? And you say, well, are you vaccinated? Um, I mean, that's, that's, are you, do you, do you take Tylenol? Do you, I mean, there's, there's so many things that we have done. I mean, do you eat corn? Do you eat bananas? I mean, all of these things are almost every aspect of our life has been bioengineered in some way, right? Almost everything we eat, everything we ingest, all of our medical treatments. I mean, in some way or another, it's, you know, playing God. But in reality, what you're doing is you're saying that you are opting to enhance or improve the life of yourself and your family and your friends and your community because you can. And and if you don't, if you don't accept that or if you're not okay with that, then you're gonna have to do a lot of work to find a place on this planet where you no longer benefit from human advancement because it's everywhere, it's prolific. I mean, I'm not, I couldn't say everywhere entirely, right? I know there are tribes that have been un, uncontacted in the world, right? And still operate on very low technological platforms in terms of their access to things. But by and large, everything we do is is engineered, everything, every part of us. And so for people who say that, I, I often wanna say things like, Are you are you okay with losing your mind someday? With I have I have a copy of the Alzheimer's machine. My grandmother died of Alzheimer's and it was horrific. It was absolutely horrific. She it took her about 15 years from when she was diagnosed to pass. And it was it was awful for her. It was awful for us, um, our entire family. It was, it's not something I ever want to see anybody go through. And if there is anything I can do to not let anyone ever again experience that, I'm going to do it. And if somebody says to me, well, that's you playing God, I'm going to say, well, you know, feel free to pray. I'll take it. Like, it is what it is. Um, and I think when when you're addressing those sorts of philosophic questions, you you really have to be really honest with yourself about what your end goal is. Is your end goal to live in the Garden of Eden, which isn't really possible anymore? Or is your goal to live the best, healthiest life that you can with the people you care about? And, and then you make your decisions accordingly. And I, I haven't yet found a person who says to me, no, I, I would, I would, I'm okay with dying of cancer without any pain medication or modifications or treatment. Like, I just, I don't find people like that. Hmm. Um, Mr. Kottenberg, when you were telling friends, relatives about your project. Um, how did they react? Did, did uh, some of them say, oh, what's the science fiction about? What are you doing there? Um, not so much because it, I mean, it's a topic that does bubble up every now and again. So I think there's sort of a general level of awareness, but um, obviously it was then really interesting if I, when I told people about the ins and outs of, of, of what is actually currently happening, I think. Um, you know, people find it fascinating that actually so much uh, work on the details and the technicalities is already happening and that this is happening. Um, yeah, I mean, there is um, sort of this other side to it. I mean, now we're mainly talking about extending, you know, a healthy lifespan to get to, you know, to 122, which is currently the, the, the maximum, I suppose, or maybe a little bit more. And then maybe someday, you know, someone will be 150 or you know but um you know there's also people who are you have this vision you look very far into the future and think that they can engineer maybe some different kind of human who can even extend that and live pretty much forever maybe and um yeah and there's issues with that and that is something that i found really fascinating as well which is um what we're not really talking about but then we kind of do um yeah because um you know Are we allowed to to tamper with this? Are we allowed to to yeah to to change our fabric and in that way? And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, these are sort of interesting discussions that I found really interesting when when making this film. Yeah, Professor Any, when when we look at um, what's happening in the U.S., where apparently a lot of money is poured into this research, um, where is Europe or Germany at at this point? Is there 
any number of money uh, invested um, that is comparable? No, far less, I believe. In Germany, there is, um, as far as I know, there are two institutions um, doing that kind of basic research. One is the Max Planck Institute in Cologne for the biology of aging. And the other one is the Fritz Lippmann Institute in Jena, also for the bio biology of aging. I think there is some investment um, on mainly neurodegenerative diseases in Horizon 2020, which is the big funding program of the European Union. But um, I think the um, the amount of money which is going into that kind of research is not comparable to what you spend in the US. Also, I think, I don't know about uh, the venture capital from Europe going into this. This would probably also go into the US. And um, by the way, another huge funder of this type of research is the National Institute of Aging in the US, where which is also spending a lot of money in the uh, basic biology of aging with the idea of preventing age-related diseases. So Europe and, and Germany, um, what is happening here is relatively small in comparison, as far as I know. Um. Yeah. There is a, a gentleman by the name of Michael Grieva, who is German, who hosts an um, uh, undoing aging sort of conference every year in Berlin. He, um, His foundation, the Forever Healthy Foundation, has founded, funded our work um, significantly over the years. Um, they also have an investment arm called Kaizu that has done a lot of work in the space, really moving real therapies, real biomedical therapies forward. Um, and if you don't know about them and you're interested in, in the German arm of longevity, I would strongly recommend you look into them. They're a really great group of people with really strong passion and dedication to our work and specifically the non-commercial aspects of our work, looking at real therapies and real um, biomedical innovation in the space. I mean, again, it's nowhere near, you're right, that the size of the NIA or some of the, the larger investments in the US, but um, they're a really great German group. Okay, thanks for that. I, I was mainly referring to what is um, publicly spent in terms of academic institutions. Um, Professor Schichtens, because there are so many um, possible repercussions and consequences, do you think that the state should somehow set boundaries to this kind of research? Um, well, that's that's a general <laughs> tricky question, how, how to... Um, in, I mean, how to guide, so to say, and gov have a good policy uh, with regard to to science, scientific aims, and and um, priority setting. In general, I think it should not be the state as an abstract um, government, but I think the the society should be included in these debates. I think that's really important because um, this type of uh, research, and this is um, first of all, I think not only. Um, for, for this area important. Um, but if you look back, I just looked it up, there's really interesting um, studies showing how the number of money was spent. Um, for example, I'm mean, just an area, I also do a lot of research is Alzheimer's um, disease and how new technologies to prevent and predict Alzheimer's have occurred in the last uh, decade. And it's really interesting to see that until let's say 2000, I mean, also in the US, the amount of money that was spent just for Alzheimer's disease was almost nothing compared how much money was spent for cancer research or for example, AIDS. And, and in this sense, I think this is really important to understand that age-related diseases like neurodegenerative diseases like dementia, of course, need basic research. And I think one fact that for this, um, disease like Alzheimer's disease, we are still missing treatment can also be, um, I mean, might, might of course result from the fact that research in this area is, I mean, comparatively new. And I mean, the success we have seen in the last years with, with regard to cancer research shows that of course it also needs time uh, within research to come to success. So, so in general, I think, yes, society and the state must be involved in, and we should not leave it just purely to the market or to, 
to individuals who feel they want to invest here and there. Um, especially because it's the society, including the healthcare system, the, the, the social welfare system, who finally will have to take the consequences, as we just discussed. And they should also benefit, or benefit of course, from these developments. So my vision is not to have an, um, the state as such, but so to say, to have a public deliberation and governance systems who consider what are societal needs, what are per, per perspectives of vulnerable groups that should be also taken into account and then to balance, so to say, these different interests and, and, and perspectives and then to find a, a good, um, yeah, comprehensive solution. Um, I mean, definitely, I think, um, I mean, Lisa in the beginning said something really interesting um, idea, namely that there is enough money to solve all the problems. And perhaps this is true. But unfortunately, I think that's not how the world functions. I think we all realize that we, we need a kind of priority setting. And, it, and therefore, I think it needs a kind of governance and it needs a democratic and a societal a balanced um, way of governing these these priorities. Um, Dr. Jane, would you would you like to have a more public discussion about the topic in general, but also about possible pros and cons? Would you uh, welcome that? Absolutely. I, mean, I think that's what we're doing right now. Um, and thank you for providing this forum and Martin for making the film. Right. It's it. It is, it is activities such as this that really provide a form for conversation for these discussions to flesh out um, how we all think about these things and how we should and what policies need to form. Um, without discussion and without broader input, it really is, um, it has the potential to skew a way that doesn't benefit the majority of the population of, of this planet. So absolutely, I think it's incredibly important to have these conversations and to have them repeatedly and often and to really work through the nuance of the things that, of the, of the effects that aging and, and extending health span will have. Hmm. Um, I read also some comments that people thought um, if aging is now seen as something that we can prevent and people have the choice somehow to do that um, that this could open up new conflicts that uh, if you if you don't choose these life extending possibilities maybe you have fights in your family about it or uh, in society dr jane do you think this is an, is a possibility that um, the value of aging is uh, is changing certainly I mean, I, th I think we have fights in our family about how we vote for different parties and different presidents, right? It's it's very, it's very similar um, there. And and what a wonderful thing to fight over, right? It it is uh, fighting is kind of a funny word because um, it it denotes really antagonism, um, but what we're really talking about is opening conversations that cut right to the heart of what it is to be human. Mm. And what could be more important? Uh, Professor Eni, uh, do you think that there could be some kind of new debate about the topic of aging in general and its value for societies, that maybe we are also more aware of what um, uh, positive aspects could there be to aging to elder uh, to be become older i think it's important to have that debate uh, of course um we are living in a period of um, global population aging and um, never before in history there has been such a huge proportion of the population who had the opportunity to get older than 65 and older than 80. And as I see it, um, I think ageism or age discrimination is a problem in society. So there is a negative um, evaluation of older adults. And we have to talk about this. And 
I think it's it's difficult to draw a line between the negative and the positive aspects of aging. And if we are talking here about the negative aspects of uh, physical aging or biological aging, some of these are well justified. But we have to be careful not to extend this um, to aging in general. And um, some of the topics we've been touching upon are also linked to that, for example, the idea that there has to be a generational change because older, older people might be less creative or run out of ideas or not, maybe not even know what to do with their times. I think in, in context of this topic, how, what, what we can do to prevent age-associated diseases by interventions into aging, how long we want to live. It's important to talk about aging in more general terms as well. So I perfectly agree that this is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I looked um, again at the, the comments we had over the last year or so since the film is online, um, uh, quite a majority of people, when they were asked do you want to live longer? They said, no, not in this world. <laughs> it was quite a negative and pessimistic outlook. Um, um, and I, I was wondering, I mean, um, what do you think about that? I mean, in general, that that uh, the global society is rather pessimistic about the future. And we're talking now about aging for first a certain group, maybe. Uh, Ms. Fabini? Yeah, I. so I have a problem with that question, actually. Because I think if you ask anybody in this world right now, do you want to live longer? They're going to say no, because what is their experience with people living longer? People become frail. People become sickly. People are in the medical institutions are and in the professional world are um, biased against. Um, you go to the doctor and the doctor says, yeah, you have that pain. Yet you're just going to have to live with it because you're old. And it's that's what they see. That's what they see their parents going through, their grandparents going through, their peers going through. And they say, why would I want to live like that? And I don't blame them. I don't want to live like that either. But if you say to them, if you could live healthier for longer, if you want to, if you want to extend your life, but what you think an 80 year old look like looks like is actually what a 150 year old looks like. Would you still want to live to 90 or a hundred feeling like maybe a 40 year old? And they're like, well, yeah, you, you mean my, my knees won't hurt anymore? You mean my hands and my knuckles won't hurt and creak and, and ache? Oh, you mean I'll, I'll be able to think straight? Yeah, of course. Like if, if you give people the idea that they don't have to be frail and disabled when they're old, then yes. The, the answer is almost always, well, yeah. There's there's very There's very few people who say, Given given a healthy life, no, I don't want to live it. Or I don't want to at least have the option to live it. And I do think there's something to be said for community. Um, I know my father has often said, well, why would I want to be around if my family isn't around? And so I, I think we've touched on that a lot in this call is that it can't just be for the select few. It has to be for everybody. But I think what you're going to find is that the younger generations coming up are more and more invested in taking care of people who are older, and taking care of their parents and their grandparents because they care about them so much and are invested in longevity in that way. And so you're gonna find as the population gets older that more and more people are interested in longevity and are interested in the real biomedical innovation of longevity and not the science fiction that most of our parents think it is. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think you're going to see it becoming a community movement. And that's another reason why our outreach department is so imperative to our work is because it's about building that community. It's about reaching the populations who still think of this as science fiction and who say, no, 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 that's not that's not real science. We go, oh, wait, wait but it is. Like, this is real technology. And then and then they get interested. But you have to you, you can't just ask them, do you want to live longer? Because all they have in their mind is what living longer looks like right now. And we're talking about an entire paradigm shift, right? And if you take the time to explain that, I think you're gonna get different answers. Mm -hmm. Professor Schicktanz, how much of, of what we're talking about is hype and how much is reality that will come in the next decade, two decades? What do you think? 
Oh, well, that's a difficult question for for a critical bioethicist, I guess, because I think it's somehow the answer lies, um, yeah, somehow in the middle ground. I think there is a lot of hype, definitely. And I mean, we haven't talked about yet, but this this idea of of um, longevity and aging healthy and and um, in a way, I mean, this is often seen as one of the oldest dreams of, of human mankind. I mean, the idea when if you go back in in the um, Renaissance, for example, this idea comes up again and again. So, um, so on the one hand, I think there is a lot of hype because it's a kind of a cultural vision which human mankind always has struggled with, with the fact of being confronted with our death and confronted with the question, what have you done in your life? And did you did you live it in a good and 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 and, and meaningful way? I mean, this is all the question. I think that that's the philosophical answer, so to say. And I think this is what, what a lot of people are concerned in one way or the other, even if they don't put it um, so 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 bluntly. And in this sense, I think it's it will always be a question in that that we are tackling with. But I think all these questions don't go away, even if we would live longer for 30 years in a healthy way, because then we can still sit there in a healthy sitting on our couch and watching more Netflix series. Is this what we really dream for? Or, <laughs> or is it then to make much more, bring more meaning, so to say, to our life, to society, to, to, to our social environment? And I personally, I was always a big fan from a totally different philosophy, and that's the Kappa DM idea. That's the idea to live in the here and now and to do the best as far as we can. And of course, having a, a future vision that we can plan things is really helpful for human. And it's also important to take moral responsibilities. But I personally think that the CARP and DM um, motto, so to say, is, is in a one way much more healthier than always think, oh, when I'm 65, I will do this and that. But now I'm, I'm 50, so I can wait the next 15 years and don't make any decision. So that's that's my idea to this problem. Mr. Kottenberg, while you were working on the film again, did your um, attitude towards your own aging change? Do you live in another uh, way today? Do you see every day like carpe diem um, more valuable or what happened in your mind? Yeah, that's a fun question because um, when I started doing well, when I started doing the uh, research for this film, and I was, um, you know, digging through the literature, and um, there's one thing I noticed, and actually, um, on most of these books that are written on, on the longevity side, every other page tells you to stop smoking right away because it's just a no-no. That's not how that worked. So I stopped smoking. So that was um, uh, quite a, a big one. And um, I guess uh, during that, I don't know if that's really, but I got myself a bio tracker. So um, to to be able to, <laughs> you know, just be a bit more healthy and, you know, get moving a bit more. And um, yeah, and I guess um, when I completed this project, which was also, you know, coincidental, um, you know, I became a father. So that was interesting. So there was a new life all of a sudden in my life. And um, yeah, that was a, a big shift of perspective, I suppose, because, you know, life started being a little less about myself. So yeah, that was that was quite interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of my final questions now uh, would be, who of you would like to be become 150 in a healthy way? Um, Professor Amy, would you would you like that? Would you choose that way if possible? I would certainly try. Yes, mm -hmm. I think uh, the important thing is to have an important, uh, have a positive attitude towards aging, <laughs> and I think I have that. And provided this, uh, I think you can you can still give it a try. And I think also the question is, is not, is this going to happen or not? it's going to happen maybe not as fast as the activists or venture capitalists believe but 
I think the the evidence is there that there is a, some kind of new knowledge, and in the long run, it will happen. And I consider it mainly as something positive, which creates at the same time a lot of problems that we've been talking about. And these problems have to be addressed, and they can be addressed, and they have to be addressed anyway, because things like climate change, population, social inequality, um, diseases of old age which affect only some groups in the population, our attitude towards aging, all these topics, they have to be addressed anyway, no matter if we live longer or not. And uh, we can live longer and try to address them. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Kaiser, if there is a possibility to live to 150 years or a company tells you we have the pill for it uh, or whatever it is, medication, how much are you willing to pay for it monthly? $100, um, 200 more? First of all, if a company tells you they have a single pill that's going to let you live to 150, they're full of it. Don't believe them and don't buy that pill. I don't care if it's a dollar. Don't buy that pill. Um, if you're going to live to 150, it's going to be a series of interventions over time. It just is. It's not going to be a miracle pill that you take and the next day you're like a 20-year-old. That's not how the body works. If somebody's trying to tell, tell you it is, they're full of it. Um, what would I be willing to pay to live healthily to 150? Um, I don't know, honestly, it depends on my priorities at the time. What, how much would I pay to be able to maintain my, my mind to not get Alzheimer's like my grandmother did an awful, awful lot. Um, it, it just is. I mean, how much do you pay for a cancer treatment these days? Right. Um, so that you, you can live maybe an extra year, even with your family and your loved ones. I think, I think a lot of it is circumstance. I think a lot of it is what do you have to live for um what is your what is your priority um what what is what are you willing to spend to make sure that you're okay and that your family is okay um martin you just said you had a baby congratulations i have three i have three little ones and i um it actually be, got me more invested in longevity not less because as much as i talk about my father a lot my grandmother and their health struggles and how i want them to be around for a long time I can't imagine a world where my kids need me and I'm not there. Like, I'm just, I, I can't imagine that. It, it's the thing that devastates me the most, not being there for my kids on the off chance they need me. So what would I pay to make sure that they never have to go through that? An awful lot. Um, but I am working really hard and my team is working really hard to make sure that that doesn't have to be a question, that it doesn't have to be, you know, how much money do you have in the bank to be able to live for 150 years in a healthy way, but it's, you know, here, take this injection once a year, take this pill twice a year. And honestly, the government is going to want you to take these things because the, the costs associated with palliative care is enormous. It's enormous. Um, taking care of elderly and frail people who are disabled is enormous. And if you can reduce that with a simple pill or an injection that you take maybe every five years, maybe every 10 years to reduce the damage in your body, the government is going to want to pay for that. So um, that's that's really the end we're, we're trying to, to wrangle for people. But yeah, I'd pay a lot probably if I had it. Dr. And I work Jane. for a nonprofit, so I don't. <laughs> Dr. Jane, you as well, you, you would have 250 if possible and you would pay dearly for it? Um, 150 seems short to me. I'd, I'd, ah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, what you're really asking is how much is, is your time worth to you? How much is your life worth to you? And that's, that's very difficult to quantify. Um, and 150, honestly, is short, right? I, I much prefer to live for a few million years, but uh, that's, that's very much science fiction at the moment. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I have a very difficult time answering that question because my time is worth a lot to me. Um, Martin, much like you, I recently became a father as well. Um, so all of a sudden, um, like Lisa said, I can't imagine, I cannot imagine life without, without my son. Um, and would I want that for as long as possible? Absolutely. Um, so, so, but that's that's sort of a very individualistic perspective. And if I think about 
how much would, would the world and population at large be willing to pay for something to live to 150? I think the answer honestly should be zero. It should just be provided to everybody, period, as an option. Yeah. Professor Schicktanz, would you take this option of 150? For me, I don't know. No, as I said, I'm, I would not never think about it. For me, quality is more important than quantity. And so for me, for all the, the orientation would be, what can I do currently? Where do in, where put I my energy into it? And I, I think, I think there is a problem. I, I, I think, no, I think I would feel that if I would have a vision to live until the age of 150 or 200 years, I would um, procrastinate and I would um, postpone a lot of things. And I think that's not very healthy <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally live and try, would live as long I live. And if I would have an accident tomorrow, then I will have it. And if I will have dementia as this can happen, then I also have a positive view on this um and i will try my best and i would also try to care for everybody in my family who has a disease like this independent whether i think um this person could could live longer or healthy i think that's also a very rich human experience to be confronted with our vulnerability and i think that's um that's part of our life um and so yeah, for me, this is the wrong question, I guess. <laughs> okay, last but not least, um, my colleague, Dieter Rosa, would you want to live 150 years, if possible, healthily? Um, personally, I'm not sure whether I, Dieter Rosa, as a person, want to live uh, uh, such a long time, but I'm, I, I'm sure that the life in me wants it. Uh, we didn't talk about the point that uh, I guess everyone has a will to live and uh, this is, uh, and this will is there because uh, otherwise you don't uh, wouldn't be afraid uh, of death. Uh, being afraid of death means uh, there is a will to live. And, uh, and therefore, I don't. Uh, I'm suspicious. We talked about uh, many um, uh, aspects, uh, negative aspects, but. Uh, uh, there are many aspects. Uh, we should, should be more uh, positive th thinking. And okay, me myself, I would appreciate it. 200 years would be fine. 200, okay. Yeah. So thank you very much for everyone who attended this very interesting discussion. Thank you for making the time for us. Um, I hope you enjoyed it somehow. <laughs> and um, if you want to get good information, switch into DW uh, or also DW documentary on YouTube or on television. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. <laughs>